Hi, and welcome to this video lecture on buoyant forces and center of buoyancy. In this lecture, we're going to talk about how you calculate a buoyant force and then figure out where that buoyant force acts on an object. So let's go ahead and get into the material. If you look on your screen, you'll see a picture of an old ship. This is the ship called Vasa. It's a Swedish ship from 1628, so from quite a long time ago. It has a really interesting history. Uh, the ship was built, uh, it was a, the king of Sweden wanted the ship built. Uh, they had designed it and it was being built, but as it was being built, um, the king had asked for additional features to be added in, onto the ship that weren't in the original design. So the ship designers had to you know, keep modifying the ship as it was being built. And um, finally, the whole thing was finished. And it, uh, so it was built, I think, in 1626 through 1627. It set sail 1628. And it made it something like, uh, I want to say, 1,400 yards. It didn't go very far. Made it some distance. And then it tipped over and sank. So it, it, uh, it was this beautiful ship but it didn't get very far before it sank. And it sank because it was an unstable design. It didn't hit anything, nothing poked a hole in it. Uh, it was just top heavy because of all the different additions that had been put onto the ship. And so when a breeze hit the ship and it tilted it off to one side, it just flipped over and sank into the, into the ocean. Now where it sank, uh, the soil, you know, the, the soil underneath the, the ocean water um, actually was it had very little oxygen in it. So when the ship sank and it was covered by the silt at the bottom of the ocean there, it was poorly oxyg oxygenated. And normally there are these uh, worms that live in the ocean that would you know break apart the wood and decompose it over time. But because it had so such low oxygen, the worms couldn't um, the, the worms weren't present to break apart the um, the wood. So the ship survived. And, uh, you know, in recent times, I can't remember when they found it, but it was, you know, within a few decades ago, uh, they discovered the ship buried in all this ocean silt. And then when they, um, you know, brought it up from the bottom of the ocean, they discovered it was in fantastic shape. It hadn't degraded like most normal wooden ships would. So they were able to <clears throat> recover it and then restore it. And they put it in this museum called the Vasa Museum located in, in Stockholm, Sweden. And uh, it's a beautiful uh, original ship that you can go and visit. Uh, and it has a very interesting story behind it. And if you have a chance, read the story behind the Vasa on the internet uh, so you can learn more. But it has to do with um, buoyance, buoyant forces and center of, buoyance, center of buoyancy and uh, buoyant stability. So these are topics we're going to talk about today. So let's go ahead and get into the material. Um, first thing we're going to do is derive what a buoyant force is. Now you probably know something about buoyant forces just from hearing things like Archimedes principle and such, but we're going to just go ahead and derive it so you can see really where it comes from. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to say we have some irregularly shaped object shown here and it, we'll just have it partially submerged like shown in the picture. So here's the free surface and the gravity is pointing downward. We're going to assume that the fluid is incompressible. And what I'm going to do is take a look at a very uh, narrow cylinder of the object and balance forces on that cylinder, just the, the pressure forces acting on it. So that cross-sectional area of that cylinder is dA. And on the top, it's atmospheric pressure. So it'll be atmospheric pressure times dA acting on the top, pushing downward. And on the bottom, the pressure is going to be higher because we're you know, deeper in the water. So it'll be that atmospheric pressure that we started with. Then we're going, to, the, we're going to say that particular cylinder is submerged to distance L prime in the liquid. So it'll be atmospheric pressure plus rho G L prime. That's the pressure on the bottom. It's just the hydrostatic component is now added to it. And then we multiply by the same area dA. So then that the net pressure force acting on that little element, so the net pressure force, will be the pressure force acting downward. I'll just put the minus there. And then the pressure force acting upward. And you'll see that the atmospheric pressure terms cancel out. And what we're left with is rho F G L prime dA. 
Just one note, the rho f just means that's the density of the fluid. It's not the density of the object, but it's the density of the fluid because what we're calculating here are the pressure forces due to the, you know, the fluid on the top or the atmospheric pressure in this case and the pressure force in the fluid on the bottom. So the rho f is the fluid, not the object. Now, if you look at this for a moment, you'll see that L prime dA is really just a little bit of the submerged volume. It's just this part that I'm kind of highlighting that's submerged. It's that little bit of volume. So I'll just write it as dV sub, just so you know it's a little bit of submerged volume. So if I want the total pressure force, net pressure force, what I'll do is integrate over the entire submerged volume. And the density in gravity can come outside the integral. And what we're left with is that the net pressure force, which is what we call a buoyant force, is just rho F G and then the whole volume that's been submerged. That is the buoyant force. It's just the density of the fluid times gravity times the submerged volume. If you look at the expression on the right hand side there, the density times the submerged volume, that's the mass of water or the fluid that's been displaced. What I mean by that is when we dunk that object into the, into the fluid, some of that fluid has to move out of the way. The, the, the amount of fluid that has to move out of the way is the volume of the submerged object, right? So you multiply that by the density of the fluid and then you get the mass that's been displaced. And then you multiply that by G and then you see that the buoyant force is just the weight of the displaced fluid. So that's just another way to look at that is the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. That's what we also refer to as Archimedes principle. The Archimedes principle, um, it comes from a story about Archimedes you know, long ago he was asked, this, so this is a story, we don't know whether it's true or not, but he was asked, to determine whether the crown that uh, the king had was made from pure gold or some sort of gold silver alloy. And what Archimedes did is he weighed the crown in air, found the weight, and then he weighed the crown when it was submerged in a liquid because when it was submerged in the liquid, there'd be a buoyant force acting on it as well that would make it weigh effectively a little less. And then he was able to use that information to figure out what the density of the crown was, and then he knew the density of gold, so he could compare the density of the crown to the density of gold to see if it was an alloy, right? if there was some uh, silver added into the gold. And I actually, I have an example problem that focuses on that, so you might want to take a look at one of the example videos. So we call this Archimedes principle. The buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. The buoyant force, as you can see from this derivation, is really just a net pressure force. What's happening here is the pressure on the bottom is larger than the pressure on the top due to the hydrostatic pressure distribution. So when you dive down in the water, you know, you're going swimming, you dive down in the water and you feel this buoyant force acting up on you, it's because the pressure on the top part of you is a little bit less than the pressure on the bottom part of you. So you're having a net pressure force pushing you up and that's your buoyant force. Okay, now, now that we know what that net pressure force is, the buoyant force, uh, let's figure out where it acts on the object. Kind of like when we did the hydrostatic pressure forces, we found a resultant pressure force, and then we found the center of pressure. We're going to do the same thing here. We're going to, we have our net pressure force, which we call the buoyant force, and now we want to find out where that center of buoyancy is located. So let's find that, uh, and the way we do that is we balance moments on the object. So we want the distributed net pressure force to give the same moment as the uh, resultant buoyant force acting at the center of buoyancy. So we'll do that on this object down here on the left. So we have the same situation. Uh, we have you know this partially submerged object and uh, we'll put a coordinate system over here. Let's find the moment due to the net pressure force on that little cylinder We'll find the moment about the z uh, axis here on that coordinate system. So we're going to say the distance out to that little cylinder is x, right? 
So let's find the moment due to that little bit. And we'll, we'll do it, the integral over the whole thing. So here's the moment about the origin. Actually, I'm not going to do this in terms of vectors. Everything's going to be about the z-axis. So we're going to integrate the kind of an r cross f calculation. So the r is just the x distance. The f we found previously was just rho f g l prime dA. It's just this part up here. It's just the little bit of pressure force acting upwards. So that's what that little bit is. So that's like our R cross F calculation. And of course, we know L prime dA is a little bit of submerged volume. So we're going to integrate this over the whole submerged volume to get the total moment. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say that that moment's the same as the moment caused by the buoyant force. So let's just arbitrarily draw the buoyant force right there. And the distance out to that we'll call XCB, center of buoyancy. So that moment is, should also be equal to XCB times the buoyant force. But we just found a moment ago that the buoyant force is rho F G volume submerged. So we can simplify because you see that the rho F and the G's cancel out. And what we're left with then, after just a little rearranging, is the following. That's our expression for getting the center of buoyancy for our, our buoyant force. That, what that expression is there, if you, um, if you look at it for a moment, you'll see that that's really just the center of submerged volume. So it's the center of volume uh, that's underneath the water here. So let's write that down. Center of buoyancy... is equal to the center of submerged volume. Now I'm talking here about, um, you know, a partially submerged object, but it holds true for a completely submerged object. Uh, you know, the, the buoyant force being the weight of the displaced fluid, that works whether it's partially submerged or fully submerged. Uh, the same sort of thing for the center of buoyancy works whether it's partially submerged or fully submerged. So the center of buoyancy occurs at the center of submerged volume. Uh, it's not the center of mass, it's the center of submerged volume. Okay, so now we know how to find uh, a buoyant force and then figure out where it acts. Let me do one other thing. Um, this little extra bit, it's not anything you need to really know for this course, but I want to connect it back to the VASA that we talked about at the very beginning of this little lecture. And it, this is, comes to, down to this idea of um, buoyant stability. So let's say we have, for example, a ship that's kind of rectangular in cross section, and it's in the water. So here's our free surface. And let's say that the center of gravity for the ship, the center of gravity is where the center of mass is, is down here. So there's the weight. And the buoyant force will be the center of submerged volume, which might be here. So the center of mass or the center of gravity is below the center of buoyancy. Okay, so this is why we, well, okay, I'll come back to this in a moment, but, but the, the, one's below the other. Now let's say that the ship is tilted a little bit. You know, the wind blows on the side of the ship and tilts it. So in that situation, um, let's say that the ship is tilted a lot like this and the center of mass is still here. Now the center of buoyancy will be over here. Remember, it's the center of submerged volume is where the center of buoyancy is. So in that situation, what we have is a restoring moment. If you look at that for a moment, you'll have a moment that wants to turn the ship back to its original position. So that kind of configuration is stable. If you take your ship and it, it's perturbed one way or the other, so that's tilted a little bit, the resulting buoyant force and weight act to try to get it back to where it was originally. This, so this kind of configuration on the left here is a stable configuration. This is why we put ballast in the bottom of ships, right? You put a lot of weight at the bottom so that you get the center of mass well below the center of buoyancy so that you have the stability. Now, 
In the case of the Vasa, what happened there was the center of mass was above the center of buoyancy. So let me draw it this way. Now if you look at that configuration, we still have the weight and the buoyant force aligned. So in, if it stayed perfectly in that position, uh, everything would be okay because the buoyant force and the weight are perfectly aligned. But if you tilt the ship, and I may not draw this very well. So now let's tilt the ship. And um, so the weight is here. And the center of buoyancy is there. Okay. Now in that configuration, we have an unstable situation. That, there's a moment here that wants to tilt the ship that way. So it wants to flip the ship over. So if the center of mass is too high, um, then, the, then you get an unstable configuration in the ship. You know, if it's perturbed to one side, it'll just keep going and flip upside down. And that's the situation that happened to the Vasa. With all these additional add-ons that the king wanted, the ship became top heavy. And so it became less stable. And then finally, when it went you know, sailing, it was stable for a while, but there was a big enough wind gust uh, that tilted it off to the side, or maybe some waves hit it to the side. It tilted it too much, and then it just flipped over and became unstable. So that whole area, it's again, nothing you need to know for this course, but I think it's kind of interesting, the idea of um, hydrodynamic stability. And it has to do with the fact that you have a center of mass that's related to the distribution of mass in the ship. That's where the weight's going to act. And then the center of buoyancy is related to the volume that's submerged. So they're not exactly the same thing. The center of volume and the center of mass are different in general. All right, we'll go ahead and end the lecture there.